I'm standing on a large mound that was identified a few years ago as the likely uh, legal centre for Fife, Dalginch, where disputes were settled. It's not far from the church, about 500 metres in this direction here, and the church would have been quite visible at one time before the railway embankment was put in. We were asking why the church at Mark Inch was so imposing, so well built, and why so much resources had been put into it. And I think here is your answer. This was an important centre of the Macduff Mormers of Fife, later El Earls, and the clan chieftain. It was for this reason that Mark Inch was important. The burn that almost surrounds this uh, mound runs all the way from Balfarg through the Balburnie estate and down to the Leven. So this area is linked to some of the oldest prehistoric centres of Fife. The monument behind me was actually cut by 19th century stonemasons for the Balfour family. But we're now going to be looking inside Mark Inch Tower and inside what remains of the nave for signs of the 12th century predecessors of these stonemasons. We'll be looking at parts of the wall that have been uncovered recently that you haven't seen before. So let's catch up on the more recent archaeology within the building. For those of you who were here a few years ago, you'll have seen that we uncovered the western side of the arch. Well, we're now underneath the plaster on the eastern side, and there was a bit of a surprise. As you can see from this diagram, we had not only the arch and the two sets of voussoirs that we saw from the other side, but we had the remains of something that told a wider story. A few years ago, after the 2016 conference, I said that we had permission to take away some of the plaster from the, the wall within uh, Mark Inch Church. Uh, and here we are. We have an area here which has been uh, taken right down to the 12th century stonework, as you can see from the, the diagonal hatching here. All the plaster, the modern plaster, has been removed. And we see a remarkable thing. We see the top of the arch here, and here is the upper level of voussoirs here. There's a, a lower level below. But above them is this deeply disturbed area, destroyed area, mutilated area, where the surface has been removed, a surface that probably contained a hood moulding with decorative carvings on it. Uh, and all that remains are the marks of the masons. These have been left by either the uh, post-Reformation iconoclasts or the, the people who destroyed the church in the 19th century to put up the balconies. So all that remains are mason's marks here and a cross right on the very top of the arch. And it looks very much as if this cross was carved as a, a, a mark of dedication possibly by one of the masons rather than being part of the official decoration of the building itself. It may be that this was designed never to be seen and hidden beneath a layer of plaster or whitewash. Certainly the middle part of the cross, the, 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 the cross piece itself, is very similar to the mark of the master mason, which you see across here. What we see here is what Moira, Greg and I, we worked on this building a number of years ago, what we think is the mark of the master mason. It's always applied in the same way along the grain of the diagonal hatching, which 
means it's almost a fingerprint of this man's work. Marks can be used, the same mark can be used from one building to another, but this mark and the way it is applied is fairly unique. We can contrast that to the next stone along where a different mason is applying his rather large bold mark here and you can see by the splayed pattern of the finishing, the surface finishing, that in fact he was using a tool uh, a bit like an adze or an axe which he was swinging uh, either between his legs or uh, possibly uh, moving a chisel around the stone. So there are different uh, conclusions we can reach from the way in which the, the marks were applied. And you can see that even though it's got an arrow in this particular stone, it contrasts with the one next door, which also has an arrow, but quite a different method of finishing the stone. So we've got to look at these stones very carefully, very forensically, to, to squeeze as much information out of them as we can. The plaster layers have been removed with great care uh, by Paul Hamilton and uh, the pieces have been stored for future analysis. But despite minute examination, no traces of paint or dye were revealed. But we'd expect any art artwork further down should it exist. Uh, and that's where we'll be working next. Now this decorated hood moulding, combined with the size of the tower and the loftiness of the nave, goes some way to explaining why Edward I chronicler referred to the church as a moustier or minster when he visited in 1296. He was referring to its grandeur rather than its administrative status, although by that time it had passed out of the hands of the Macduff family and was in the possession of St Andrew's Priory. Now above the arch, and above the hood moulding that we looked at here, would have been an opening. And this is the lower part of a door which we've revealed from the other side, from the tower side. Remember we're in the nave now. And we're trying to find out whether in fact this was an open door which looked down on the nave, perhaps with a balcony of some description, or whether in fact there was a floor level in here and it was space for storage or domestic space or whatever uh, detached from the nave entirely. So the next phase of the uh, plaster removal is a section here to see whether in fact we've got a, a floor level uh, or not in here. And that will help us to determine the function of this particular opening. Now, as Martin's Church is on the Pilgrim Way, we've made this base of the tower here into a sort of mini museum. But it's the opportunity to show you some of the archaeological features that we uncovered a number of years ago. We took off uh, a skin of modern plaster work very, very carefully. And before that, we of course copied all the modern graffiti that was on it. But underneath, we began to reveal some of the mason's marks, uh, 800 in all, and uh, probably representing about 25 to 30 masons. But what we have in here is a blocked doorway, first of all. Behind the plaster was a blocked doorway, and that explains why we've got that little door at the side, high up on the tower. It's not defensive. It's probably an 18th century insertion that was put in there when the lintel broke here as a result of the 18th century door being inserted. The door had to be blocked up because of uh, the, the danger of subsidence and they cut another door in, in the wall uh, on the north side of the tower. Also here worth mentioning is a couple of slots either side here, which we think are the spindle of a wheel that was used to transport the stones up the tower. Another thing that turned up 
unexpectedly, when we were doing the work in here, and this was in the graveyard about uh, 20 yards from here, was this section of the chancel arch. Now, we've got the tower arch behind me here, but at the other end of the building would have been probably a brightly painted chancel arch with this chip cut carving on it, quite diagnostic of the Anglo-Norman period. You see this all over Normandy, this particular pattern all over Normandy, if, if any of you have been there. The other thing worth mentioning is something not from the 12th century, but was found in a neighbor's garden, and it's a kind of remnant of the, the Reformation. All the uh, decoration within the church would have been torn out at that period, and this little dragon shelf here was uh, obviously taken away as a, as a souvenir. We're going to go up onto the bellows, that's the, the structure that you see behind me, by the way, they're still working, which makes this probably the oldest building in Scotland that's been in continuous use. We're going to go up there and we're going to see something that I think explains why this, this building has got such a, a high quality of craftsmanship and why it has survived for so long. Now, this is the arch that we discovered, not in any of the textbooks, a number of years ago when uh, the old 19th century roof was demolished. As you can see, it's got two sets of very well cut voussoirs flush with the surface of the wall, which is quite unusual. Normally you get a stepping back of voussoirs and uh, it would be much more three-dimensional. So I suppose we've got to ask ourselves the question, what was so different about Mark Inch that this particular technique was employed? Most of the stones have a, a, a mason's mark on them, um, but really the picture gallery of mason's marks is in front of me here because the range is, is, is quite great. But one in particular is worth examining more closely, and that's what we think is the master mason's mark, accompanied by a little diagram instructing the masons how to lay one stone on top of another. Obviously this was something that was unusual to many of them, they would have been drawn from many parts of the, the, the country, and some of them might have been used to the type of uh, stone construction that you find, for example, at um, Breaking Round Tower, uh, where there was a much more uh, hazard approach to putting the, the stones together. This was very disciplined. Each block was cut to roughly the same size, and they were assembled, overlapping each other by 50%. Uh, and that gave strength to the building and was one of the most important aspects of the, the, the structure. Rammed home by the master mason by putting a notice up on the wall saying, this is how you should build. We're right in front of the west face of the tower. And it's a bit blowy so I hope you can hear me. But what we have here is an 18th century door and I want you to ignore that because we're concentrating today on the 12th century features of the building and all of this stonework is 12th century. The tower tilted slightly during construction and that was corrected by adding a slight fraction onto each of the blocks on the right hand side here so it straightened up as, as it went up the tower what we see is a small window above the door that is original 12th century but it's unlikely that there was any opening at all at the lower level of the tower and that made it very strong very defensible with an extremely thick wall which the masons of the 18th century had to carve through in order to make this, this doorway. If we pan up slightly, we can see the first of the features that are identifiable as typically 12th century. And this is a, a frieze or a, 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 a decoration, if you like, of, of the tower, um, which originally would have had a diamond 
pattern or a lozenge pattern. And possibly, we don't know this, <clears throat> they might have been brightly painted. But then there's another bit of extravagance, if you like, another string course, uh, and above that, three holes, which we interpret as being uh, holes left from the, the scaffolding arrangement that they had in place. Yet another window, above that, more putlog holes, and a very unusual belfry window, which we'll discuss later. Right at the top, we have more putlog holes, and just above the clock, you can see a little window. That's an interesting room, which we'll go into later. The whole of the south wall of the church was rebuilt in the late 17th century, probably. It incorporates many stones from the old Norman style building. In fact, embedded within these stones are three sections of chip cut carving using the same design that we've already seen from the piece of hood moulding inside the tower. In fact, there are even two pieces of stone that may have come from an even earlier building. This coming together of stones here, I think represents the northeastern corner of the original chancel. And you can see these large stones here with the diagnostic uh, quartz grains running through them. This is very much 12th century. Across the far side there, and ignore this building here, which is much later, you can see some vertical stripes. Now these are arrow sharpening marks from a, a, a later period. But because they would have been done at eye level, they would have been inscribed at eye level when the archers were uh, taking their practice, obviously they weren't small archers. What we were talking about was a much lower ground level at that time. So this is only the top of the base of the chancel. Now, if we can pan up a bit, we can see a plaque which is from the 1500s, and that's Prior John Hepburn's plaque. But he didn't build this, he inserted his plaque into it as part of a campaign to, to become Archbishop of St Andrews. And he did this with many buildings. Uh, throughout the St Andrews area. He possibly heightened the chancel and the stonework at the top is different and may represent some of his work. We've come out of the west door of the tower, an 18th century door. We've gone round the corner and in order to gain access to the tower, we're going to go up through this door here, which I think is also 18th century. It's not a defensive door as we once thought. In fact, when this door was struck through, the ground level was up here, as you can see from the stonework and the, the wear pattern on, on the stones. While we're here, just point out the width of the nave, very, very narrow. In fact, the nave only came to the right hand side of that dark stone there. So wide tower, narrow nave. We're going to go up the tower now and we'll see some of the handiwork of the masons and this time we're concentrating on the workmen of the tower and the construction techniques rather than the history of the elites that were the patrons of the building. So follow me up the tower and we'll see what was created 900 years ago. first floor of the tower now and I'd like to take the opportunity to draw your attention to yet another mason's mark. An interesting one and again one that involves the mark of the master mason. But this time it's a little triangle that's on the stone. I worked with this, I worked on this with Moira Gregg and both of us think that this may be a, a, an apprentice or an initiate and this is the uh, Master Mason giving his seal of approval, if you like, uh, to that individual, or perhaps 
someone who has just joined the, the team and is showing to the other Masons that this is the new mark. We're going to go through this door here, which is a door that links the tower with the nave. And we're going to discuss why this door was built and what its function was. It means going through and up onto the ceiling of the existing church. I'm standing just above the ceiling of the modern day church and looking back at the tower. And the tower has on it a series of marks. These are the roof lines of the successive stages of development of the church. The steepest is the 12th century one. Above it would have been some sort of finial or cross, and above that would have been uh, part of the, the decorated uh, frieze uh, that went around the, the church. The door pierced the tower at this point, the door that I've just come through. We're not sure whether that was a door into storage, a storage area, uh, whether in fact it was part of domestic arrangements, possibly in connection with the visits that the, the Lord made to the, the area during the, the time of, of um, legal, uh, legal disputes and uh, hostings of the army. We're not even sure whether in fact it may have been a place where the priest stood and looked down at the congregation, perhaps displaying uh, relics or, 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 or whatever. That is the area we're concentrating on just now. And the next area of plaster that we'll be removing, hopefully will answer that question. We're up here in the bell chamber. And uh, this bell is round about the early part of the 19th century. But we're not sure if there was always a bell here. And it's something we're going to try and investigate as part of the, the further workup. Now that shakes the entire tower. I can believe you can believe me. Um, what I wanted to point to in this room, and I think it is a room because it's quite well decorated and I think a lot of money has gone into the, the arches on four sides here. The windows are more like domestic windows than uh, would be required for a simple belfry. And I'm just asking the question whether this room might have had more than one function. Could it have been a, a scriptorium where uh, charters were possibly read or or um, even written? Uh, could it have been a, a lookout tower for hunting parties, perhaps associated with entertainment? It, it looks as though it might be something a bit more than a simple belfry, especially when we remember that up above is quite a substantial room which was used for something, probably valuables of some description, whether uh, ecclesiastical or secular. The window arches are all decorated with mason's marks. One mason, one who, whose, whose mark is a, a pentangle, has worked on three of the four windows, north, west, and south. But there are many other marks all over the chamber. So we're going upstairs now to the storage room and we're going to ask what was, what was stored at that level? We're right up at the top of the tower now in a room that's quite large, quite well lit and whose function we really don't know. It's got large footlog holes in the inside. Now remember we saw some on the outside previously. Well this looks very much as though the beams that were supporting the scaffolding on the outside went all the way through the tower 
and there was a separate set of scaffolding on the inside. We've got what looks like a, a dedication cross up here, and the letters AP. Of course, with graffiti, we don't really know exactly how old it is, but it's quite possible that this was a dedication at the beginning of the uh, tower's history. Now, this little bit of graffiti here is interesting because it looks like uh, a picture of a crane lifting a series of roof trusses. Now, we don't know if this dates right back to the early days of the building, but the angle of the roof trusses looks very 12th century to me, and it may tell us something about the, the construction uh, uh, techniques of that particular period. So moving up to this small window here, in fact there are four on either side, we ask ourselves, was this a lookout tower? Did it have a significance possibly in terms of uh, hunting, uh, parties coming up here to, to spot game. Was this room for storage? Was it for storage of valuables? We still don't know. There's a lot more work to be carried out. But if we look on the south wall, we see something that's quite curious and we haven't got an answer for yet. So this little oval shaped hollow here is a bit of a mystery. Uh, it could be 12th century, in fact, uh, Marie Claire Semple thinks it might have been where uh, a relic was stored, because you can imagine there would have been woodwork in front of here and possibly a door. It could have a much simpler explanation, it could be uh, much more recent. But uh, I'll leave you thinking about that one, and uh, it's one of these answers on a postcard uh, situations. Quite uh, interested to know what your thoughts about it might be. There are many fascinating aspects of this building that I haven't been able to cover in a short piece of footage. There's the work we carried out with Oliver O'Grady using the ground penetrating radar to confirm the building's footprint. And there's a lot more to say on the dating and in particular the original patrons of the building. There are also literally hundreds now of well-documented buildings that we can use as comparators. And then there are the slender traces of evidence that we have for a building that stood here before the Norman style structure that survives. There's still a ring ditch to investigate and are Mark Inch's mysterious terraces connected to the mound where the church stands? Is it perhaps an augmented mound using sand from the hill? And of course, there's the later medieval and the post-Reformation history of the building as well. But hopefully today, I've given you a glimpse into the world of the 12th century Mason. Although we mustn't forget that many other trades were involved. The Wrights, the blacksmiths, the carpenters, and the artists whose work is more perishable. I would reckon that during construction, this must have been the equivalent of an oil rig being assembled in the middle of Fife. I hope also that we've opened up some questions as to the possible multifunctional nature of the building. Is the building something more than a church? Now this is a community driven project, but we do need more professionals to work alongside us. There is much more information to squeeze out of the, the data that we've already collected. But we lack access to scientific testing facilities and to expertise. If you have some special knowledge or even just enthusiasm for the work underway, please get in touch. There's so much more to learn.